Amen. Welcome. I'm Danny Makeupson. They call me D Mac. So, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dad. So, your love is relentless. Think about that. Your love is relentless. Day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, decade in, decade out, century in, century out, millennium in, millennial out. God's love is relentless. He is not going to give up on you. He's not going to give up on you. He's not going to give up on you. His love is relentless. Amen. Amen. Okay, saints, um, I got to give a little disclosure. A, a little self-disclosure here. I'm not holding nothing back tonight. What I mean by that is that I am totally submitted right now to God. And his word is going to come, and I'm making no apologies for his word. Not a one. So when I'm talking, it's going to be loud. So you can move back so we can make some adjustments. So if, if, but I'm not yelling at you. I am passionate about this subject. Pastor Troy, when he asked me to speak, he says, what are you passionate about? It's in the book. <laughs> How do we know his love is relentless? It's in the book. It's in the book. And so I don't need to defend the Bible. I believe what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said is it, the Bible is just like a lion. You don't have to defend the lion. Just let him go. It'll do whatever it want to do, right? The lion did defend himself. You don't have to defend no lion. So let's get started, amen? amen? Gracious Father, in the precious name and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our King, Father, I ask that you would remove me and any word that comes out of my mouth that is not of you, I pray it burn out of the recesses of their mind, never to be heard again. But God is your word comes forth, may it change the lives of every person that is in here tonight. Move me out of the way, God, so that your word will go forth and do what you've called it to do. Your word will not return to you void because you are not a man that you should lie nor the son of man that you should repent. It's in the book. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Woo! I'm excited, y'all. Yeah. Woo! How many people are familiar with the show, uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Yeah. All right, all right. So we know some folks. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that, for those of you who aren't familiar with that show, but it was a po popular game show um, a while back by Regis Philbin. Phil Philbin? Yeah, thank you. I, I never could pronounce his name. Regis Phil. Ben. Regis Field Ben. Thank you. So there was two familiar phrases that he had. I'm not going to ask you. I'm only going to share these two familiar phrases. And um, that one of those phrases I'm going to use up front. And in the last phrase, I'm going to close us out with. All right. So the very first one is lifeline. The lifeline. And so part of the lifeline is part of this show was that that each contestant got to call on somebody or take away some answers and, and it gives you a 50-50 chance, right? So that, that's the one, one thing, it says 50-50. And so some people think they will make it to heaven with a 50-50 chance. That, that's, uh, they're trying to do a good, enough good things to cover their bad works. But how, if you could help me sometime, 
How can you, uh, not how can you, but 50-50 chance, you're banking your eternity on whether you've done enough good things. How do you know when you've reached enough good things to cover the jacked up stuff you've done? <laughs> you got to be a pretty good accountant. You got to be a pretty good, I mean, you got to be on it, Jack. And I hope you ain't like me where you forget a lot of stuff. There's so much junk I've done and I've forgotten about. I remember one time I was going to the store um, and this, um, just going to the store, getting a coffee or something. And I'm going to pay for my, pay for my uh, coffee. And the lady behind the counter said, you were mean. She, oh, uh, she, she, uh, she's like, you were just nasty. I, I don't even see, I don't even remember being that way to her, but she did. And so I just started beginning thinking, yeah, I did some jacked up stuff. So I, I can't necessarily deny any of her claims, um, but she has that proof on me. So banking your eternity on a 50-50 chance, that's. That's pretty scary. So uh, let me get a volunteer. Young man. Yeah, could you stand up for me? 50-50 chance right here, right? Heads or tails? Tails, you're going to heaven. Heads, you're going to buzz hell wide on. All right, you ready? You going to heaven? Oh, you, yeah, you're going to heaven. You're going to heaven. Are you willing to risk that? Are you willing to risk that 50-50 chance of whether you're going to heaven or not? <laughs> Amen. 50-50 chance. There's another lifeline. See, some people, they live their lives based on that 50-50 chance, and others are, uh, are, are like this. Phoning a friend. Now, there are some people that I would like to call on. I mean, if I'm going, who wants to be a millionaire? There are some people that I would call on, like a David Arona. That guy knows something about everything. <laughs> but it's like a 50-50 chance. And so 50-50 chance, you got, I mean, not a 50-50 chance, but you got to phone a friend. And, and a lot of times you're counting on ideas that your friends are going to get you out of this. How do you know if they're right? Not to say that your friends aren't sincere, but you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. There's, hey, I'm serious. A 50-50 chance and phoning a friend. Uh, anybody ever have a friend that, that you thought was pretty cool, but then they did something totally jacked up? Yeah, amen. And so we take and we use our lives and we dictate our lives based on what our friends are doing. We live our lives in a way that, that, that reflects our friends' ideas. We live our lives in a way that reflects what they think, the way that they act. And finally, how about the ask the audience? Ask the audience. That's your last lifeline, by the way. That's your last lifeline. And so that's where you get to call on the audience, and it's a majority vote. It's a majority vote. So, <laughs> so there's, there's the ask the audience, and then there's that opportunity where people got to... Uh, where you, you've asked your, the audience, and the audience will say 25, 35%, 45%, et etc., cetera, et cetera, and they break down based on their responses. And now you're left with the bag to make a decision. Win or, win or, win or lose, right? Win or lose. So a lot of people in this new age, they believe that the Bible is outdated, and there you are. If you ask in the audience, most people 
have totally abandoned the Bible, totally thrown it out of the way so you can do whatever it is that you want to do. Amen? You can. It's in the book. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. See, so don't look at me like I'm pathetic. The book said it. Amen? So let's, let's, let's start out with my for, uh, first, first point here. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. When you get there, say amen. Amen. All right, all right. Oh, you can follow the screen. That's awesome. Yeah. Amen. If you want to follow the screen, you can. But Pastor Troy encourages us to don't look at us. Don't, don't just take our word for it. Don't take his word for it. Look it up for yourself. How do you know that this copy is right? But see, that's what I, I'm here to kind of share with you why I like the Bible, why I'm passionate about the Bible, why I love the Bible. But don't bank your eternity on me. I ain't going to help you, Jack. I ain't the one. Because my sin, my sin will not be able to pay for your sin. It's only Jesus Christ. And how I know that? Because it's in the book. It's in the book. So this is my NASB. And so I'm going to read from the, what Pastor Troy really loved is the, is the NLT, the New Living Translation. So, verse 16, for we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. When he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets, you must pay close attention to what they wrote for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ, the morning star, shines in your heart. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Amen? Amen. So, it's in the book is the title of this message. And I want to break down that verse, what Peter, those verses that Peter talked about. And so what I came up with is we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, they, they reported, excuse me, they reported supernatural events that took place in the fulfillment of specific prophecies. That's a lot. For, <laughs> in the fulfillment of specific prophecies, but they claimed that their writings were divine rather than human in origin. That's a mouthful, so I'm going to break it down. Very first point is it's reliable. Amen. This book is reliable. This book is reliable. Y'all with me? All right. We got reliable documentation. Unlike any other book, the Bible has been scrutinized. It's been beat upon. It's been ripped up. It's been burned. It's been, but it still has stood the test of time. Amen? Amen. It is still tested. It is still being tested. It's still being tested today. So unlike any other book, like the Quran, for example, and I, we have nothing against um, Muslims, we're going to love on you anyway because it's in the book. Amen? Amen. We're going to love on you anyway. Uh, but unlike the, the Quran, where God spoke to this particular person, and whatever he says, that's what goes. You, you, you can't question it. 
But when you, when you take a look at the Quran, you'll see, you'll begin to see all of the holes poked in it. You'll see the inaccuracies. Same thing with the, with the Mormon Bible. Joseph Smith, he makes the claim that he heard from God. This is the book. But through testing and testing, you start to see the holes being poked in it. So the Bible, let me tell you how the Bible is different. What we got here today is a collection of historical documents. And it is reliable because it is 66 books collectively brought together, we have, which has been written in three different languages. Three different languages. Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew. Three different languages. Also, the Bible tells us, uh, what we learn from the Bible is that it was also written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Now, in order to keep something pretty consistent, written, on, written from three different continents, written on three different continents, written, by, uh, written in three different languages, and then guess what? We also have 40 different authors, 40 different authors, and they all have this same schema. It runs all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. It's a stellar exploration for you and me <laughs> in the B-I-B-L-E. Na, 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 na. I did a um, vacation Bible school and that song was in there. And so... Truly, the Bible is not like any other book. And so each author comes from different, lives of walk, um, different lifestyles. Different lifestyles. You got kings. You have shepherds. Now, look at, look at, how, look at how far that is, a king and a shepherd. We got uh, uh, prophets. We have fishermen. We have uh, princes, governors, cupbearers, and these people lived in different time frames. They lived on different continents, different areas. Boy, that's a lot of collaboration to just make up something for you to kind of believe in, right? <laughs> and so that's what sets the Bible apart. And so... Uh, not only is it three different languages, three different continents, written over 40 different things, but there has also been at least 25,000 uh, archaeological digs. And none of those archaeological digs, based on the Bible, have turned up anything that would contradict what the Bible has said. Amen? It confirms what the Bible says. It doesn't contradict it. It actually confirms. So how do you know? It's because the Bible mentions names. For years, they, uh, people claimed, oh, there was no such thing of Hittites in the Bible. Uh, it's in the Bible they found. But as of late, in the late 1900s, guess what they found? They found, a, they found a bunch of tablets with the word Hittite on it. See, again, they confirm these things. That's why I take, this Bible is powerful. It's in the book. It's in the book, Amen. So that leads me to my next point. It was written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. So 2 Peter, 2 Peter, that, that verse 16 there. Can we get it on the screen? There we go. For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. This ain't cleverly devised stuff. There were eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. See, that, that's a game changer. You can go down to any jail right here, downtown Puyallup. You can go to Tacoma. You can go to Pierce County. And all, there's a bunch of them. You can go to any one of them, and you can ask any one of the um, men or women that's in the jailhouse and say, hey, do you have, let me ask you this. If you had a witness to your alibi, would you, be in, would you be in jail? See, we got 40 different witnesses. We have 40, we have 
authenticated so many eyewitnesses that, see, this ain't clever tales. These, uh, these words were written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. There were eyewitnesses written. There were eyewitnesses. Um, so check out John chapter 1, verse 4. Um, John chapter 1. Y'all got your Bibles? I don't think I got that one in my notes, but John chapter 1. Let's look at this. John chapter 1. I love to hear the Bible just going crinkly like this. You know? That's some good stuff. Now, now, this is where my passion is really getting ready to come out, all right? Because I, I, I'm, I'm getting ready. Ooh, this, this is good, y'all. This is good. This is good. 1 John chapter 1. Oh. 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 Y'all ready? What was from the beginning... What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. I'm, oh, that's good. John says, we've seen with our eyes, touched. Think about that. This ain't some cleverly tales. John is an eyewitness telling us that he didn't just make up this cleverly tale. It says, we proclaim to you the one who has existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes, touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Verse 2, and the life, and the life was manifested and we have seen, listen now, we have seen and testify. I'm going to tell y'all about this. I, I, I can't keep it. It's like fire shut up in my bones. I, not only did I see, we touched him with our hands. And we testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, with the Father, was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that your joy may be made complete. This is good stuff, y'all. I don't know what you're reading. But as I'm a witness, John, precious John, John, y'all know about John. Pastor Troy talks a lot about John, the disciple in whom Jesus loved. <laughs> this John, he says, we seen with our eyes. We touched him. I can imagine just being at the fire camp with Jesus. You know, he's sleeping. And Peter and John, they wake up like, he was walking on water. <laughs> he, ra he, raised the, he raised the dead. Good. He healed the blind. Take that in. This is good stuff, y'all. Take that in. This word tells us that no, we're not coming up with you with this cleverly crap. This, this is real, y'all. We touched him. We seen him. We know him. And we're going to write to you and we're going to proclaim to you, he is good. So that your joy may be full. The reason why we don't have joy is might be because we don't have the fellowship. John says... We have fellowship with the Father through Jesus Christ. I read somewhere. There is joy in the presence. There's joy in his presence. Joy forevermore. You see, this is good stuff. So not only we got our witnesses, y'all. I ain't done yet. We got some more points here. 
we got more points here because it's in the book. Turn to Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Oh, I'm getting excited. I'm starting to spit. <laughs> Woo! This is good stuff. We seen him. We touched him. Acts chapter 1. Y'all there? Amen. Oh, that's why I like to hear. Amen. Acts chapter 1. There we go. I love it. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Jack. Yeah. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. During the 40 days after his crucifixion. Read that again. During 40 days after. After his crucifixion. I don't know about y'all. How many have seen that Mel Gibson movie? You think you can survive after that? 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared. He appeared. He appeared to the apostles time and time and proved and proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. We don't have cleverly tales, y'all. We got a book that has been tested. We got a book that has been tried. We got a book with eyewitnesses to this thing. We got witnesses that have touched and have seen Jesus Christ do the things that he's done. I'm going to try I'm going to tie this up with one more point, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I read somewhere. Hey Amen. Y'all track it with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Y'all there? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 8. Now let me remind you this is the Apostle Paul. Paul says, let me remind you of something. I'm going to remind you, dear brothers and sisters, the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you from, that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true. In the first place, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. I ain't through yet. But just as the scriptures said, just as the scriptures said, Christ died for our sin. Monica kind of shared with us earlier about for a righteous man, one might do it. But what if you're not? That's jacked up, but check it out. <laughs> so, just as the scripture said, he was buried and he raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. It's in the book, y'all. Just as the scripture said, he was seen by Peter and by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by more than 500, y'all. 500. 500 of his followers at the time, uh, of at 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive. So while this book was being penned, Paul is telling you that you don't even have to believe me. You can go check with some other witnesses. 500 more. Some of, some of them are still alive. There are some that died. But some of them are still alive. Then, although some were still alive, though some have died, then he was seen by James and later all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at a wrong time, I also saw him. 
Paul seen Jesus. He didn't see Jesus while he was doing his miracles, but he knows some stuff had been going on because he was the one that was persecuting the Christians. So he knew about Jesus, but he'd never seen Jesus. And so now Paul is saying, after his death, burial, and resurrection, that's when Paul seen him. It's reliable, y'all. It's been written by witnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, Peter said. So some people say things, man, I just can't believe the Bible. It's just been translated so many times. Anybody heard that argument? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. So I had heard that too. And so, wow, you know, being an early Christian, I'm like, what about that? Why is it? Why has it been translated so many times? When I got my um, chemical dependency professional license from the state of Washington, y'all, it was a great celebration. It was a great celebration. I went to Applebee's and my wife done set it up. All kind of people were there. It's like we filled up all the half. Well, to me, it felt like it was at least half the building that we, we had it at C3. And so we did this game that where I tell this person and it went around and by the time it got to me, it didn't sound nothing like <laughs> what it started out to be. So you hear this witness. You see, that's not how we got our Bible, y'all. Yeah. Let, let, let me tell you. See, when minds are young and impressionable, especially in college, I had this challenge in college myself. I'm like, why in the world is woman coming at me like that? Like, that's not how we got that. And so some people, they either ignorant or evil or both who kind of make that claim. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You see, the Bible wasn't translated. See, I didn't get, we don't get the NASB from the NLT. And then we go to the NLT and make the King James. And then we make the King James. And then, no, that is not how your Bible was written. Your Bible was written in Greek. Hebrew and Latin. And in order to make your translation, I didn't go and talk to Ricky and then Ricky went and talked to Sean and then Sean went and talked to, no. They went back to the originals. To the original documentation. So they didn't come up with this and then go up to another one and then go to another one. If you learn Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, you can check the references yourself. You can go, you can go back to the original copies yourself. The ones that have been excavated from the 25,000 plus archaeological digs, if you can read it, and you will see with 90 plus percent, 99 plus percent accuracy, what we got here today is the exact same thing we got way back when it was written, y'all. Oh, whoo, this is good. If you ain't getting nothing, God, thank you. He's giving, he's giving me something. I miss this, y'all. Don't let people steal your joy. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. So, I must also mention that there's no other book that comes close to the Bible. No other book that comes close in comparison. Homer, Iliad, uh, 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 Sophocles, Caesar. So people believe that Caesar was a real man. How do they know that? Because it's stuff been documented. But in comparison, see the Caesar, Caesar was written back in 100, um, the event happened back in 100 to 44 BC, but we don't get the original copy of Caesar until a thousand years later. And guess what? We only got 10 copies we only have 10 copies compared to, we got 25 plus thousand uh, New Testament documents. And not only that, it was written within a hundred years from the time of the actual event after Jesus' resurrection uh, and, and the close of our canon. What we have is within... And this is moderate. I mean, this, this is very uh, conservative number here. Uh, within 100 years, we have a document dated close enough to the original text. All right. 
I'm not going to beat a dead horse on that one. So we're going to keep on moving. So there's this gentleman who, who get paid a lot more money than I do and been doing a lot more studying than I do. His name is Matt Slick. Matt Slick says it this way. And I quote, as you can see that there are thousands more New Testament Greek manuscripts than any other ancient writing. The internal consistency of the New Testament document is about 99.5% textually pure. It is an amazing, it is an amazing accuracy. In addition, there are over 19,000 copies in Syriac, Latin, Coptic, and Aramaic languages. Totaling and supporting the New Testament manuscript base is over 24,000. That's where I get these numbers from. So it's reliable. Written by eyewitnesses. My next point. They reported supernatural events. Second Peter. Chapter 1 verse 17. They reported supernatural events. When we received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice from the majestic, from the from majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly son, dearly loved son who brings me great joy. So when Jesus was baptized from John, it's in the book. Don't look at me like I'm pathetic. The book said it. They reported supernatural events. They heard a voice from heaven they didn't have what we got nowadays. <laughs> in the early century, uh, back in uh, when Jesus' time, they didn't have these amplifiers and whatnot. They actually heard a voice that came from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Or the new, uh, new, English, uh, new Living Translation says it. Uh, <clears throat> so they reported supernatural events. They heard the voice. Uh, from heaven. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. We got that one? All right, moving on. So, but they heard the voice, but you can turn there yourself. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. <laughs> Matthew chapter 3, <laughs> verse 17. Y'all there? And behold, a voice out of heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Supernatural event. A supernatural event. And again, some of these um, I, I talked about Jesus walking on water. That is a supernatural event. Anybody seen that YouTube video where these kids are water, running across the water? It's been disproven. You see, because what they was doing, they done built the little bridge up under there and then taping it and make. No. When they saw Jesus on the water, they went ahead of Jesus. Jesus was on the hill. The big storm was on the ocean. I mean, not the ocean, but the lake. There was a big storm. They, they thought that they was about to die. And uh, you can read it for yourself there in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 33. Jesus was walking on the water during the storm. They reported supernatural events. We got to go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Get there. John chapter 9. This is my favorite, y'all. Pastor Troy have preached out of this, this text before, but John chapter 9. Y'all there? They reported supernatural events. I know this is like a fire hose coming at you, but I, I want to demonstrate to you guys why I like the Bible, why I love the Bible, why am I so passionate about it? Because again, this is a reliable text written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They reported supernatural events. And here it is, John chapter 9. As he passed by, he saw a man 
Blind from birth. Blind. Oops, so out of so. No seeing. That's the only Korean I learned while I was there. So uh, he, saw a man, he saw a man blind from birth. Verse 2. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Verse 3. Jesus answered. It was neither that man, it was neither that, it was neither that this man sinned or his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Uh-oh, I got to park there for a moment. So what you might be going through, God might be ready to do a work in you, amen? That's free. I ain't going to charge you for that one. That was free. So if you're going through something, you might something been on you a long time. They said, no, it ain't about his parents. Jesus said, it might be because I want to show the glory of God in you. So while you're sitting in what you're sitting, keep believing him. Keep believing him. Jesus might be ready to heal you. He might be ready to heal you. It says that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Verse 5, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of spittle, of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So, he went away and washed and came back seen. Therefore, the neighbors and those who, were previous, those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is, this, is not this the one, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. Next verse, y'all. Next verse. It's good. Everybody else might be saying something about what you got going on. And people want to deny the blessing that God has put on your life. People want to deny what God has done. People want to deny. The man spoke up and said, no, it's me. No, God did this to me. I used to be blind. Keep reading here. It says, uh, <clears throat> and he answered, the man who, uh, he kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes open? He answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the Siloam, go to the Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. And so great controversy might come from the blessing that God has given you. Don't let nobody take your blessing. God has done a work in you. And what I meant by tonight when I said I'm let it all out, so this is the passion that you might be hearing. What I'm saying is, is that I succumb Self-disclosure, I succumb to the pressures of others chipping away at what God has done in my life. Don't do it, y'all. Don't do it. It's I. See, God took me from the muck and the mire. He broke those addictions from me. But I let other people chip that away. I'm going to keep moving. So, controversy over this man. They brought him to the Pharisees. So now they're going to try to prove this, that Jesus couldn't have done this. So verse 13, they brought, um, they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now, it was the Sabbath day. It was on the Sabbath, on the day that when Jesus made the clay and he opened his eyes, then the Pharisees also were asking him how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied the clay to my eyes and washed, and I see. 
Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can this man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what did you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. Then the Jews said, then the Jew, the, the Jews then did not believe it, believe it of him. And he had, did not believe of him that he had been blind and he had received sight until they called, uh oh, until they called the parents of the very one who had received sight. And he questioned him, saying, Is this your son? Is this your son who, is this, is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he see now? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son. We know that this is our son. Excuse me, I'm lost, I'm losing my, getting old, y'all. Get some glasses. So now, now that we know this is our son and that he was born blind, verse 21, but how he now, but how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes? We do not know him. He asked him, ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. This is a grown man. Ask him. They reported supernatural events. See, this stuff substantiates our word. Raising Lazarus from the dead. I'm not going to turn there. I'm, I'm, I'm laboring on this point here because I want y'all to understand that they reported supernatural events. And John said it this way. Uh, uh, John said it this way in John chapter 1, um, John chapter 21, verse 25. Jesus, di Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that was written. John said it. Don't look at me like I'm pathetic. John said it. <laughs> all right. Fulfillment of specific prophecies. My next point. Jesus himself said in Luke. Give me that second Peter um, chapter one, verse 19. There we go. Because of the experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the Christ and Christ, the morning star shines in your heart. Fulfillment of specific prophecies. Jesus said, uh, Jesus himself said in Luke, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. I ain't got time to turn there, but you can. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. If you read it for yourself. Jesus on the road to Emmaus, not Jesus, but the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, they kind of explained it. And Jesus was walking along with them after his um, death, burial, and resurrection. And that exchange, if you read that exchange, and after Jesus had opened it up and showed them about what was going on, they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn? Did not your heart burn as he opened up the scriptures? Have your hearts burned in a while, y'all? Read it. Read it. It's good. My heart's burning right now as, as we kind of unpack some of this stuff. So, fulfillment of specific prophecies. Man, I got some time here. Woo! So, David, fulfillment of specific prophecies. Remember this. Uh, David, just as all the other prophets, David wrote under the divine inspiration by the Holy Spirit in Psalm 22. 
That's my, one of my favorite psalms, Psalms 22. Jesus, uh, perhaps David didn't understand completely what he was writing at the time, which is why it was uh, prophetic. But as we read this today, there is no doubt that this was a prophecy about Jesus. So let's take a look at Psalm 22. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's my King James right there, y'all. That NLT don't, don't, don't do me justice right now. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus uttered those words while he was on the cross. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you read Psalm verse 22, verses 6 through 8, they ridiculed him. So not only was Jesus, Jesus initiated this one when he was saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And see, when you kind of read it, you'll begin to see as they ridiculed him, they would say things like, come down off the cross. Let, let God save him if, he, if he's that man. You see, they was ridiculing him. David wrote this a thousand years before Jesus would even utter those words. A thousand years. Fulfillment of specific prophecies, y'all. A thousand years. And David had never seen a man hang on a tree. Crucifixion wasn't even invented yet. The Carthaginian didn't, um, didn't do it yet, nor did the Romans perfect the crucifixion. So before crucifixion comes up on the line, David shares how our Savior was going to die. A thousand years. That's that millennial, y'all. <laughs> A thousand years. His love is relentless. Yes. Verse 22, uh, chapter 22, verse 12. Bull surrounds me. The bulls was representation of the, uh, verse, verse 12, there, the bulls surround me. The bulls represent the Jewish leaders at that time. David writing this a thousand years before Jesus would die on the cross. David is pinning this. But Jesus Christ is fulfilling these things, specific prophecies. Specific prophecies. That's what this word says, it's specific prophecies. Verse 14, I'm poured out. Jesus Christ was speared, um, pierced in his side and blood and water flowed out. Verse 14, his heart would max wet. Uh, his heart would um, melt like wax within him, verse, um, 20, uh, verse 14. Verse 15, he said on the cross, I thirst. And they gave him um, wine to drink when he was crying. Verse 16 of chapter 22, dogs surround me. This was a reference to the Roman soldiers. They called them dogs, Gentiles. Specific prophecies. Again, don't look at me like I'm pathetic. The book said it. Uh, they pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 18, they divided garments and cast lots. Jesus Christ, they, they cast lots for his garments. Not only would the people who wrote the Bible, would ha they'd have to even get their enemies to go along with what everything that was happening at one time. Specific prophecies. Specifics. So if you want to deny the cross, that means you got to get your enemies on board with what you said a thousand years before it ever happened. And they have to be in line and in sync. We got a reliable document, y'all. We got a reliable documentation. And I could go on and on and on. I ain't through. Zechariah. They betrayed him. They, they betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. It was written what he would be betrayed for. 
They, it was written in Zechariah. They betrayed me for 30 pieces of silver. Matthew picks that story up in chapter 26, verse 15, 14 and 15. Zechariah also talked about the 30 pieces of silver, where it would be thrown. They threw, Judas threw the bag, the money bag back in the temple. The Messiah's body would be pierced. John talks about that in chapter 19. God's will that he would die for mankind in John chapter, I mean, Zechariah said it way back when. And then the fulfillment in John chapter 18. And my final point. They claim that their writings were divine rather than human in nature. They claim that their writings was divine rather than human in origin. 2 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse 20. Y'all there yet? We got it. 2 Peter, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the, pro from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. Amen. This is not just about some cleverly tales. We got a reliable documentation. We got a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. During the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, they reported supernatural events in fulfillment of specific prophecies, and they claimed that their writings were divine rather than human in origin. So Peter tells us, that above all, y'all, we didn't just write this. We were moved by the Holy Spirit. They didn't know it, but God knew it. That's why he preserved our word. That's why we got it right now. So it ain't men who wrote this thing. Some people have that belief. I can't, I can't believe, I can't believe it because man wrote it. Well, then you just, you can't believe nothing you've ever read then because man wrote it. You can't believe nothing you've ever read because man wrote it. But that's not what their claim is. They claim that their, their words were um, divine rather than human in origin. So they make this claim that, no, I can't believe it because man wrote it. Again, you would have to dispel everything that you've ever learned from any book that you've ever read. Read. If you want to make that claim. So, in conclusion, what do I do with all this information? What, like I said, that was fire truck, there's a lot of information, but what do I do with all that information about the Bible? Believe it, y'all. It's in the book. It's in the book. It's in the book. So, when you have issues with Jesus, when you have issues, when you and I have issues, take it to Jesus because he says that I have overcome the world. Right. When, you, when, when, you, when you're stuck in addiction and anxiety is pressing upon you, you can call on Jesus, y'all. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. Are you, are, are you, are you suffering? If, if, if you're stressed out, why don't you grab James chapter 1 verse 2. I'm giving you some equipment, y'all. James chapter 1 verse 2. Let's go to it. James chapter 1. So when you're going through and stress is on your back, James chapter 1. Verse 2, consider it joy. Consider it joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So when you're going through those, stress, those stressful times those, and, and you're heavy hearted, God has written us this beautiful love letter. And you can go to it. You can count on it. That's what Jesus did when he, when, the, when he was tempted, he went back to the word. He went to the word. 
So if you're stuck in some sins, some secret sins, and it don't seem like you can pull your way, you can pull out Je Jeremiah chapter 33. Call on me, God says, and I will answer and show you great and mighty things, things that you don't know of. Grab that word, y'all. It, it, it is what the word is what saves you. The word is what saves you. When you've run into a dead end and there's a great sea of obstacles before you, and the enemy is pressing down on your back, you can do like Moses says, stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. Amen in Exodus. When you're feeling alone. Take hold of Psalms chapter 147. Trust him, y'all. I'm going to have the band come up. Let's pray. Gracious Father, in the precious name, of our Savior Jesus Christ who has given us his love letter. God, I pray for each and every person who is going through whatever they're going through that they will be made new today. God, we can have hope because you've said it. You don't lie. Thank you for preserving your book. Thank you for giving us the grace and the mercy. Thank you for the reliable documentation. Thank you for giving us witnesses to your miracles. Thank you for us who have experienced the miracles. God, there is no one like you. We trust you. And so, God, for those of us who are here today who don't know you and maybe have never understood anything about the Bible, Jesus said it this way, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear me knocking, open up the door and I'll come in. And I'll sit with you and dine with you. That's not a promise that I'm making, but it is a promise that God makes. That he will personally come and sit with you. So maybe people don't know what to believe. God, I pray that they can believe and trust in you today that they can trust you with their whole heart. And God, thank you for this opportunity that you've given us tonight to respond to your word. And I pray, Father, that the hearts and the minds of those are challenged to test your word, to believe and to seek the answers that they may need to get through another day. Finally, what Regis Philbert said, <laughs> when you don't know, is that your final answer? In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>